Good morning, Suki Hotu. Happy greetings to all the brothers and sisters in the Dharma. Welcome to another video lecture. Thank you for joining us this morning. This is the second in a series of video lectures on the Four Noble Truths from the first sermon delivered by the Buddha, the Dharma Chaka Pavatana Sutra, setting into motion the wheel of Dharma. In the previous lecture, we discussed an overview of the Four Noble Truths. Continuing from there, the topic today is stress and distress, referring to the two types of suffering the Buddha described, physical suffering and mental suffering, based on the two Pali terms, Dukkha and Domanasa. If you look deeply into the original teachings of the Buddha, you will notice substantial correlation with modern scientific research. Therefore, it is helpful to examine the Buddha's teachings from a modern and scientific perspective correlating with findings from the fields of medicine, psychology and neuroscience. This sharing draws from my own research and experience and from lessons learned from my teacher, the late Venerable Dr. Madhawela Punaji Mahatera, and the several books written by him, as well as from the scriptural text in the Pali Canyon. A quick word about my teacher Bhante Punaji. Before Bhante Punaji entered into monkhood, he practiced as a medical doctor for many years. As a lay person, Bhante Punaji came from an aristocratic family in Sri Lanka and was the sole heir to a great family fortune. When he realized his calling in his thirties, he gave it all up and became a monk in the Theravadan tradition. During his monkhood, which spanned over 50 years, while residing in North America, Bhante Punaji received a doctorate degree in philosophy and another doctorate degree in psychology from Boston and Harvard University's joint program. Therefore, his explanations of the original teachings of the Buddha carried with it qualified and learned views from several perspectives. Let us begin with a quick recap of the last lecture, where we spoke about the Four Noble Truths, which Bhante Punaji translated as the Fourfold Supernormal Realities. Please review the previous lecture available on YouTube. In the Four Noble Truths, the Buddha used the word Dukkha, which normally translated as suffering. The real meaning of the word dukkha is quite varied and broader than simply suffering, which we shall explore shortly. To keep it simple, let us just call dukkha generally as suffering. The first noble truth the Buddha stated there is dukkha. The Buddha pointed out eight conditions of dukkha Every one of us, without exception, experiences dukkha throughout the day, suffering from moment to moment, every day of our lives. The Buddha stated this first noble truth is to be understood. And this sharing aims to elaborate suffering from a modern and scientific perspective for better understanding. The second noble truth, Samudaya, refers to the origin of suffering. The origin is commonly attributed to craving. This word craving is translated from the Pali word Tanha. It is important and helpful to realize that the more precise translation offered by my teacher Bhante Punaji of the word Tanha is emotional reaction because we react emotionally to everything we see, hear, smell, taste or touch. 
unless we learn to abandon our emotional reaction to what we see, hear, smell, taste and touch, we will continuously experience all kinds of suffering. That is why the Buddha pointed out that this second noble truth, the origin of suffering, is to be abandoned. To abandon emotional reaction to whatever we see, hear, smell, taste or touch. In the third noble truth, the Buddha used the word Niroda, which is a very powerful word to mean a complete and remainderless cessation of all suffering through attaining the highest and most supreme bliss of Nibbana, to become an enlightened being, to become an Arahant. The Buddha made it clear every single one of us has the potential to become enlightened, to become a Buddha. Cessation of all suffering comes from complete and remainderless abandonment of all kinds of emotional reaction to every experience. The third noble truth is to be realized. That means once we realize we have this potential to become enlightened, we may strive to make this happen. If not in this life, then in a future life, by never giving up on this striving, life after life. This is where the fourth noble truth comes in, Marga, the way leading to the cessation of all suffering. The Buddha systematically laid out eight stages of cultivation known as the Eightfold Way. Some call this the Noble Eightfold Path. My teacher Bhante Punaji calls this the Supernormal Eightfold Way. This Eightfold Way is to be cultivated. That means we have to learn it, we have to understand it, we have to realize it, and then we practice it until fruition. In every religion, there are two aspects to the religion, the doctrinal aspect and the practical aspect. The Four Noble Truths represent the doctrine for all Buddhists to comprehend, and the Eightfold Way represents the practice for all Buddhists to apply in daily life. To deepen our understanding of the first noble truth of suffering, we need to examine more closely the real meaning of the Pali word dukkha, which is quite varied and suffering. If things are not as we want, we may experience insecurity or dissatisfactoriness. Then we become unhappy and we experience stress and distress. Stress is a technical term that refers to the biochemical chain reaction in the body with hormones flooding the body and affecting various organs. These biochemical chain reactions lead to physical pain and discomfort. Therefore, stress is a physiological or bodily suffering. When stress arises, and we are not able to recover from it or adapt to it. Such bodily discomfort disturbs the mind. And this mental or psychological disturbance is a distress. So simply put, stress refers to the suffering that is physical and distress refers to the suffering that is mental. Some people may want to break down suffering into its various manifestations. There is no end to this. You can sit there and list down a hundred varieties of suffering. Suffice to say, we will just focus on the two major areas of suffering, stress and distress, the physical suffering and the mental suffering. This is drawn from Buddha's reference to those two Pali terms, Dukkha 
and domanasa, describing the two forms of suffering. In several sermons in the Pali Canyon, when the Buddha elaborated on suffering, the Buddha mentioned there are five stages in the consequences of suffering. These five stages are Soka, feeling of grief or sorrow, Parideva, experience of lamentation, Dukkha, experience of physical suffering, Tomanasa, experience of mental suffering, and Upayasa, being overwhelmed by suffering. Some people think of these as five different types of suffering, but this is not the case. These are five stages or five levels which are the consequences of suffering. If you examine these carefully, you will notice there is a progression. When first encountering suffering, we begin to grieve, we feel sad, feeling of sorrow arises. Then we become insecure and dissatisfied and our mood begins to change. This is Soka. Then we want to cry out, lament, scream, shout, sigh, whatever it takes to express this grief or sorrow. This is Parideva, lamentation. Then we become aware there is physical pain or there is mental anguish. Here, the Buddha used the word Dukkha in this context to refer to the physical pain or stress. Pali is a very unique language. Some words have different meanings depending on context. Dukkha is such a word. With every experience of suffering, the mind is disturbed. This is a psychological disturbance, which we call distress or mental anguish. Take for instance, we wake up one morning with a fever. What is the first thing we notice? The first thing we notice is not the fever, but the discomfort of it. And it is hurting us. This is Soka. Then we feel like crying out, lamenting. This is Parideva. Then only we begin to notice why. And that is because we have a fever. This is the physical pain, Dukkha. And this completely destroys our peace of mind. This is mental suffering, Domanasa. This is how the stages progress. We do not normally notice the fever in the beginning. We notice the discomfort first. Then only we notice the fever or the cause of suffering later. With physical suffering comes mental suffering. At this point, we try to do something to relieve the suffering. We may take some medicines to make the fever go away. If the fever subsides, we feel better, we feel good. Our mood becomes more positive. But if the fever gets worse, we begin to feel upset, anger, frustration arise. And if the fever becomes very intense and unbearable, we may even carry a temporary thought, oh, I wish I will die. This is upayasa, exhaustion, when we momentarily give up. In some extreme unbearable trauma, the victim literally commits suicide. This extreme is upayasa or expiration, or the victim may experience a cardiac arrest during the trauma and die from this heart attack. This is also upayasa. Or the victim may fall into deep depression or post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. This is also upayasa, expiration or exhaustion. Sometimes this leads to death, either by suicide 
or by cardiac arrest or by some form of severe irreversible illness. Let us now look at how dukkha affects us, how it affects the body physiologically, how it affects the mind psychologically, and how it affects the brain neurologically. All three are interrelated. That is why this process is called the affective process. You feel it every day, whether it's a screaming baby or your screaming boss, a traffic jam or a final exam. Stress is a part of everyday life and has evolved as a tool for survival. And when you face the threat of failure, your brain triggers a biochemical chain reaction, flooding your system with hormones and causing physical changes, which we collectively label stress. And every stress response he just mentioned is triggered by your amygdala. When you're facing stress, the most primitive part of your brain, the amygdala, signals a flood of hormones into your bloodstream that includes adrenaline and cortisol. These hormones cause your breathing to quicken, your heart to pump faster, and your senses to become sharper, all in an effort to combat any perceived threat, even if that threat is just a tough crowd or your daily commute. Even though stress is something most of us experience every day, you probably know less about it than you think. Here to explain more about your brain and stress is Dr. Chess Stetson, a neuroscientist from Caltech. So the classic description of stress, it's a chain reaction of signals that makes its way out into your body and then induces all of the responses that we associate with stress. Not all of the things like increased heart rate are bad. They may just be there to get you through a demanding situation expediently. The Buddha used three words to describe the mind as an activity. When light enters the eyes, we perceive visual objects, we see. When sound enters the ears, we perceive auditory objects, we hear. When aroma enters the nose, we smell. When flavors come into contact with the tongue, we taste. When tangible objects contact the body, we touch. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching form perceptions. The Buddha used the word vijnana to refer to the mind's awareness of what was perceived through our sense organs. This is the process of perception. In Pali, this is called Panchakanda, or the five aggregates, leading to the awareness of a perception, Vijnana. With each object perceived, the mind tries to identify what was perceived by giving it a name or a label. This identification process is called Papancha, or recognition. With each object identified, the mind tries to interpret the meaning and add meaning to the object. This is conception. Cognition and conception are collectively known as the cognitive process. The Buddha calls this cognitive process mano, which also means our ability to think. Mano refers to the thinking process as well. Whatever is perceived and cognized, there is a feeling associated with it, whether it is pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. The mind reacts to this feeling and this reaction is tanha, which is commonly translated as craving, but it is really an emotional reaction. Tanha is our emotional reaction to what we see, hear, smell, taste, or touch. Feelings lead to changes in mood, and mood changes lead to temperament, the urge to react. This is our emotional reaction. This is the affective process of mind, which the Buddha called citta. From a layman's perspective, 
you can refer to the affective process as emotions. So, simply put, citta is also referring to emotions. So the three words the Buddha used to describe mind as an activity are vijnana, the perception of what we have sensed through our sense organs, mano, the cognitive process that processes the message coming from our sense organs, and citta, the reaction to feelings associated with these perceptions. Mind is the activity of the brain and the body. To keep this simple, there is a rough correlation between the processes of the mind and the activities of the brain and the body. The brain has evolved over millions of years into three main layers. The most primitive is the brain stem, located at the end of the spinal cord, through which nerves from the body enter the brain. The brain stem is responsible for many autonomic functions in the body, keeping the body alive. This is why it is called the survival brain. Nerves from the five sense organs carry sensory messages to the brain to be processed into perceptions. Next comes the limbic system, which is responsible for processing of emotions. The limbic system is responsible for activities in the brain and the body that release hormones and neurotransmitters flooding the brain and the body. This causes changes to how organs in the body react. This reaction to hormones lead to the experience of uncomfortable feelings and sensations which we commonly call emotions. This is why the limbic system is also referred to as the emotional brain. The most recently evolved part of the brain is the outermost layer known as the cerebral cortex, where many cognitive functions take place. This is where cerebral cortex is also referred to as the thinking brain or the learning brain. In a nutshell, the limbic system or the emotional brain is responsible for our suffering. The cerebral cortex or the learning brain is responsible for our happiness. Let us take a closer look at these two brain layers. Deep inside the limbic system, the brain's emotional command center is a tiny structure known as the amygdala. The amygdala scans all sensory inputs to detect for any sign of potential threat or danger to the organism. When the amygdala is aroused, it triggers the release of stress hormones, causing the fight or flight reaction to protect the organism from harm. In this way, the amygdala evolved to become the bodyguard to the organism. When the amygdala is unnecessarily aroused, this fight or flight stress reaction is very harmful to the organism. That is when the amygdala becomes the terrorist in the brain. Therefore, you can say the amygdala has two paradoxical roles, the bodyguard and the terrorist. The brain controls every aspect of our lives. As humans have evolved, it's doubled in size. It weighs only three pounds, but it consumes 20% of all the fuel our bodies take in, generating enough energy to keep a light bulb burning. And you have to consider the brain having evolved like an old house, where we just added different rooms. And so there's all these stairways and connections. Thank you.
In the basement is the oldest part, called the brain stem. It's something we share with reptiles and other mammals. It's what keeps us alive, governing vital functions like heart rate, respiration, digestion, and blood pressure. Things that happen without having to think about them. The next level up, the first floor, more evolved. Hundreds of thousands of years later, it's called the limbic system. And this is very important in the processing of emotions. Within the limbic system are the amygdala, two nuggets of tissue, one in each half of the brain. They are no bigger than a fingernail, yet they are the brain's central command center for our emotional reactions. One of the simplest and strongest of these is fear, a primal emotion we all share. If you had to pick one brain region that was most important in fear, it would be the amygdala. What scientists discovered is that as humans evolved, another part of the brain, called the cortex, also became involved in processing fear. The part that makes us most human about the brain is our frontal cortex. If the amygdala is the first floor, the cortex is the second floor of the brain. It's the brain's thin, wrinkly outer layer that's divided into four sets of lobes. If you unfolded the cortex of a monkey, it would be about the size of a piece of paper. If you unfolded our cortex, it's about four sheets of paper large. And the reason it's wrinkly is because you have to squish it all inside of the skull. The frontal lobes comprise the area just above our eyes, and these are the newest rooms of the brain. As humans evolved, the frontal lobes became the place where conscious, rational thought is processed. It's where we do our problem solving. The frontal lobes are so interesting because they are really the conductor of the brain. They synchronize all activity. Scientists made a major breakthrough in fear research when they found that information from our senses reaches the amygdala almost twice as fast as it takes to get to our frontal lobes. The speed of the different brain signals means unless we instinctively know how to react to a potential threat, we may freeze in fear, waiting for the frontal lobes to catch up to figure out the right response. Part of what happens with fear and panic is the unknown, is not knowing what to do next, and so your brain essentially freezes the way a deer freezes in the headlight. So the amygdala may get very fast signals about fear, um, even, but sometimes they're wrong, and quickly the situation may say to you, no, it's not a fear situation, and you're not afraid. So these very quick amygdala signals that you get can be controlled in sort of a top-down way. The amygdala can be controlled in a top-down way. By top-down way, we mean that we apply the processes of the thinking brain, the learning brain in the cerebral cortex to be able to take control and tame and calm the amygdala. By calming the amygdala, it leads us to become more peaceful, more relaxed, more composed. And when we are more relaxed, peaceful and composed, we feel happy. So happiness is really the experience of peace of mind, relaxation of the body and complete emotional composure. The cerebral cortex is made of four main lobes. The frontal lobe behind the forehead, parietal lobe over the top, temporal lobe on the sides above the ears and occipital lobe at the back. Of these four lobes, the frontal lobe plays the most critical role in our happiness. It is responsible for these several functions. Of all these functions, the most critical functions for our happiness are those in the bottom two lines. Decision making, goal setting, planning, judgment, reasoning, and rationalizing. Many people seem to have a misunderstanding of how happiness comes to be. They think happiness happens only when certain conditions are fulfilled, when they get what they want, or when something happens according to their wishes or desires. They think happiness is dependent on external circumstances. External circumstances only bring us pleasures, which is not 
a sustainable form of happiness. The secret to sustainable happiness is that happiness begins with the decision. Once you have decided you want to be happy and realize it does not depend on external circumstances, you begin to set goals. How you want to be happy, plan and carry out necessary actions, assess or judge what is right from wrong, reason out the cause and effect, and what is helpful actions versus harmful actions, and rationalize your resources to behave in a manner that brings you happiness. This is where mindfulness training comes in. Train your cognitive process to become conscious and mindful of the feelings associated with every perception instead of blindly reacting to the perceptions. This reaction is always emotional in nature. So the secret to sustainable happiness is to learn how to calm your emotional reaction. When you are mindful of these feelings, you are able to remain calm and composed when emotions are aroused and not allow the emotional brain to react unconsciously to the feelings associated with every experience. I will discuss these trainings in future lectures where we will look at how we can learn and practice mindfulness techniques to help us become more peaceful and happy. That is sustainable happiness. Manifestation of stress reaction in the body, the fight or flight stress reaction. When the amygdala is aroused, the brain sends a message to the glands and the glands release hormones. The adrenal glands release two powerful stress hormones, adrenaline and cortisol, which are carried to various organs in the body through the bloodstream. The organs react to these hormones in their own unique ways. Heart beats faster, blood pressure rises, respiration deepens, and muscles become tensed. Hair stands on end, pupils dilate, facial expression distorts, perspiration and trembling starts, and body temperature rises. Emotions are generated by structures hidden deep in the brain. The tiny almond-shaped amygdala is the first to respond to an emotional event, triggering a series of split-second reactions within the brain's emotional core. Waves of nerve impulses travel down the brainstem, setting off an instantaneous visceral response throughout the body. A lot of the time, the machinery that produces the emotion is operating without us noticing it at all. Creating changes in posture and facial expression, altering the way the organs inside the body are working, preparing the body for what's needed next, generating chemical responses that you will never know existed. And all of this is what constitutes the emotional state. For most people, awareness of a feeling follows just milliseconds after an emotion is created. The body sends signals back to the area of the brain responsible for conscious thought, making us aware of our feelings. Process of experience is a chain reaction. Activities in the environment stimulate our sense organs and perception arises in the mind. The Buddha calls this vijnana. It arises because of the five aggregates when we are able to see, hear, smell, taste, and touch. With that, the cognitive process of mind, mano, arises in trying to identify what was cognized by referring to memory from the past. And this process is called papancha, recognition, giving rise to cognition and conception. With 
what was perceived and cognized, there is a feeling associated with it, pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And the affective process of mind, chitta, reacts to this feeling. And this is where the amygdala kicks in. The amygdala reacts and causes a biochemical chain reaction that releases hormones throughout the body, causing tension in the body. This is stressor. It causes tension in the body and it disturbs the body. This is a physiological disturbance, commonly called stress, leading to the fight or flight reaction. You either want to fight against it or you want to run away from it. That's why it is called fight or flight reaction. This corresponds to what Hans Selig called stage one alarm reaction in the general adaptation syndrome. This is the general adaptation syndrome developed by endocrinologist Hans Selig, describing how organisms react to stress. There are three stages stage of reaction, stage of resistance, and stage of exhaustion. Hanseli, who spoke about stress, he spoke about the thing called the general adaptation syndrome, which has three parts, the alarm reaction, the stage of resistance, and the stage of exhaustion. Alarm reaction means, now if someone dies or some close relative dies, we begin to cry and lament, grief and lamentation. That is the meaning of soka parideva. Soka means grief, parideva means lamentation. And then that is called the alarm reaction. That means we react in this way when that someone dies or something very unpleasant happens. Then the, if we keep on crying and lamenting, say for one month, and at that time people will not be even able to eat or sleep properly, if you are crying and lamenting for one month, what happens? Your body becomes completely sick and all kinds of pains come into the body. And not only that, even your mind is depressed. That is called the, age, the stage of resistance because you are resisting what happened. You are not willing to accept the death of your mother or your father or your brother or sister or whoever. And that is a stage of sickness in the body. And then if it still continues beyond one month, what will happen? You will be completely exhausted and as a result, you might even either commit suicide or you might automatically die. That is called the stage of exhaustion. And this is all in the words of the Buddha. Soka Parideva is the alarm reaction. Dukkha Domanas. Dukkha is the physical pain. Domanas is the mental pain. That is the stage of resistance. And then the last stage is upayasa. Upayasa means exhaustion, where you might even commit suicide or die. So this is really a very interesting thing that the modern scientists who are uh, explaining these things they are really talking about what the Buddha has been saying long time ago. So this shows that the teachings of the Buddha 
is so important and also it is a fact. It's not just a blind belief. So it is very important to understand these things and begin to practice these things so that you can be free from all sufferings of samsara. With every experience, emotion is aroused. We have to understand that there are two dimensions to emotions. There is the physiological dimension, which we call stress or dukkha, physical suffering. And there is the psychological dimension, distress or domanasa. With each of these dimensions, there are two activities. There is the arousal and there is the reaction. Whenever we experience anything and emotions are aroused, the amygdala is activated and it triggers this biochemical chain reaction, causing physiological disturbance to the body. This is stress. With stress arising, it disturbs the mind. And when the mind is disturbed, memory, imagination, expectation arise. The mind begins to proliferate and start to think all kinds of thoughts because of memory, because of imagination, and because of expectation. This is an emotional excitement or mental proliferation. And this causes a psychological disturbance to the thinking mind, mano. So chitta, the affective process causes disturbances to mano, the cognitive process. And this disturbance is called distress, domanasa. When distress arises, the mind enters into a state of perplexity. There is a tug of war between feeling and thinking, between the affective process of mind, chitta, which leads to feeling, and the cognitive process of mind, mano, which is the thinking part. And these two are in conflict, causing us to react in unusual ways. We react and behave in a manner known as loba or dosa or moha. Loba means we experience lust and greed towards something that is pleasant. Dosa means we experience something we experience anger and hatred towards something that is unpleasant. And moha is delusion of self-centered existence, thinking that I, me or mine is being affected. All this corresponds to what Hans Sally described in General Adaptation Syndrome as stage two, the stage of resistance. So in the human being, the thinking part is called mano, whereas the emotional part is called chitta. But the Buddha pointed out was, what has to be done is not to obey the chitta, what is happening today is that the mano part, the thinking part, is doing what the chitta wants. You see, chitta is dominating the mind. And the mano is just catering to the chitta. There is a verse where the Buddha says, Chittena niyati loko, Chittena parikasati, Chittasa ekadhammasa, Sabbeva vasamang bagu. What that means is Chitta is dominating the world. Chitta na niyati loko. Loka is the world. 
చిత్తేన నియతి లోకో చిత్తేన పరికస్తి చిత్త ఈస్ డిస్టర్బింగ్ ఎవ్రీథింగ్ చిత్తస్ ఏకదమ్మస్ చిత్త ఇస్ దట్ వన్ థింగ్ సభ్యేవ వసభంగు దట్ ఎవ్రీ వన్ ఈస్ స్పెల్ బౌండ్ బై చిత్త ఎవ్రీ వన్ ఈస్ డామినేటెడ్ బై చిత్త like being spellbound so therefore the only thing is to learn how to gain control over the chitta the emotional part arousal of emotion and the reaction of emotion is a vicious cycle When we experience something from the environment and the body is flooded with stress hormones disturbing the body and the mind we have to learn to stop this if we don't stop this and the mind is disturbed that means the chitta affective process disturbing the mano the cognitive process the mind is in a state of perplexity it can trigger a continuous release of hormones the amygdala continuously release hormones and this is very unhealthy this is the vicious cycle chain reaction this leads to the amygdala being stuck in high gear and we call this amygdala hijack where the amygdala is stuck in high gear continuously releasing stress hormone causing the victim to fall into deep depression this is what han sele described in general adaptation syndrome as stage 3 the stage of exhaustion the victim can fall into deep depression the victim can also enter into post traumatic stress disorder or having suicidal thoughts committing suicide or even entering into cardiac arrest and the person can die from this that's why it's called the stage of exhaustion also known as the stage of expiration and the buddha calls this upayasa at massachusetts general hospital in boston scientists are examining the fear response scanning the brains of people with and without post traumatic stress disorder one part of the brain in every test subject is highly responsive the amygdala The amygdala is a small structure which cares a lot about threat and fear. If there's something that may be potentially harmful to us, it is a brain area which gets activated very quickly and recruits other areas of the brain to try to deal with this unexpected circumstance. The uh, amygdala sends outputs to the body so that your muscles begin to tense, uh, hormones are released, blood pressure goes up, and all of these are part of the protective response of the body uh, designed by evolution to help you stay alive. Imagine you're walking down a path in the woods and all of a sudden there's a curved object that looks like a snake on the ground and you find yourself stopping with your leg resting above that object and you look down and see that it's simply a stick. So why did your leg stop like that? In the normal brain, the amygdala acts like an early warning system, alerting us to danger. But the amygdala does not act on its own. The frontal cortex, where we think and reason, plays a crucial role. There are two parallel routes of fear processing in the brain. One will go directly to the amygdala. It's a quick and dirty pathway and trigger a fear reaction unconsciously. 
but then as the information slowly makes its way to the cortex, the cortex perceives the difference between the stick and the snake and says it's only a stick. Once the discerning cortex has determined that there is no call for panic, it sends a message to the amygdala, quieting the fear response. But in post-traumatic stress disorder, the cortex is held hostage by a volatile amygdala. Thinking is hijacked by emotion. People with PTSD are very sensitively tuned to pick up threat and respond to even very minor stimuli as if the life were in danger. Consequences of emotional reactions that lead to our suffering. There are five internal consequences. Soka, which is grief. Parideva, which is lamentation. These two correspond with what Hans Selle described in the general adaptation syndrome as stage one, alarm reaction. Then there is physical pain and suffering there is mental anguish and these two correspond to what Hans Selle described as stage two, the stage of resistance. And finally, if we are not able to overcome or adapt, then we may experience upayasa, exhaustion and expiration. And this is what Hans Selle described as stage three of general adaptation syndrome and now i will share with you a simple tip how to recover from emotional arousals and adapt to the situation i call this the three-step self-compassion train your mind to become mindful of things that are happening causing changes to your body affecting your feelings you becoming aware of emotional states arising and thoughts popping up disturbing you so learn to pause so the first thing you should do is pause don't react right away and when you are able to pause you allow time for emotional excitement and anxieties to subside you also allow time for these hormones that have been released for them to dissipate and next learn to relax take a deep breath and as you take a deep breath your body begins to relax and calm down and your mind becomes more composed so take deep breath relax the body consciously compose the mind to be ready to respond and then think T-H-I-N-K, think. Purposely focus on thoughts and actions that are helpful and beneficial to do, overcome the problem or adapt to the problem. Right? So pause, relax, and think. These are the three-step self-compassion actions you can take when your emotions are aroused. THINK is an acronym, T-H-I-N-K, THINK before you speak or you act. T, T means truthful. Is it truthful? What is the truth? You see, we'll take a simple example. Somebody said something that hurt you, upset you, you get angry. And what do most people do when they hear something that makes them angry? They react, they shout back, they scream, they cry. What happened? What is the truth of what has happened? Well, that person has just said something to you. And that is the truth. That person has spoken some words to you. You heard it. But feeling hurt, getting angry, that is your own reaction. That person didn't make you angry. You made yourself angry. That person just said something nasty to you and you reacted emotionally and you became angry. That is the truth. The truth is not that person hurting you, but that truth is you yourself reacting, hurting yourself. You know, there is an old adage. I hope you remember this or you've heard this before. It's called, 
Sticks and stones may break my bones, but your words can never hurt me. Well, if you use a stick and hit me, or a stone and throw at me, it hurts me. But if you say something to me, that doesn't hurt me. What hurts me is my own reaction, my own internal conception, my own story making in the mind, making me feel angry and upset. That is what is hurting me, my own emotional reaction to what you have just said to me. So that is the truth. Then you begin to think about what can you do to recover from the situation. In other words, what is a helpful thought or a helpful speech or a helpful action you can take that can help you recover from this situation? And think about what can you do to adapt to it? How can you improve on this situation? So helpful thoughts and helpful things are like when somebody criticizes you, realize that that person is saying something that could be helpful to you. So what do you do? The first thing you do is thank that person for offering you a criticism. Say thank you. Now when you say thank you to someone, you are less likely to provoke that person to become more angry. Because that person hears you say thank you, that person may soften down. And then ask that person, why did you say that? And by learning more about why someone says something to you, you can improve yourself. And then think about if you want to say or do something towards that person, is it necessary? And for necessary. And finally, the secret to sustainable happiness is kindness. Every, every thought you carry, every speech you make, and every action you take, always do it with kindness. And that can lead to sustainable happiness. So, T-H-I-N-K. Okay, there you have it. The secret to how to become more composed and calm when your emotions are aroused. So, pause and don't react right away. Then relax with deep breathing. And then think about what is truthful, helpful, how to improve on it, what is necessary, and finally, how to be more kind to yourself and to the other person. This is the secret to sustainable happiness. I hope this simple tip helps. And with this, I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much for joining us. I wish you good health comfort, peace, and happiness. During this past hour, we have spent this time together wisely and meaningfully and benefited from the sharing of Buddha Dharma. In so doing, we have accumulated much merits from this sharing. Let us all rejoice in these merits and share them with all sentient beings. Let us put our palms together and recite as follows. We dedicate the merits we acquired from this sharing of the Buddha Dharma to all beings affected by the coronavirus pandemic around the world. May suffering beings be suffering free. May the fear struck fearless be. May grieving beings shed all grief may all beings find peace and relief by the grace of the merits we have acquired may we never follow the foolish may we follow only the wise until we attain the highest and most supreme bliss of nibbana sadhu sadhu sadhu